Shalom. I'm Brother Rael from Reunited Soul, and in this video, I'm going to discuss why the Most High did not want his people marrying into other nations, and what was expected of our ancestors who came out of Babylonian captivity with strange wives. And by strange, I mean foreign. Those who are not Yazrael. So, let us nourish our soul with scripture that we may reunite with the Most High, the Elohim of Yazrael. All scriptures will be read verbatim from the King James Version Bible. Now, let's get right into it. First of all, I understand the sensitive nature of this topic. Are people marrying other nationalities and or having children with them? Our people have made covenants in marriage and are heavily vested in people of other nations. They're emotionally, physically, and spiritually attached. In some cases, the people of these other nations want nothing to do with our people. And some of our people in this situation will probably consider themselves very fortunate to be able to marry such a person. A person that despises our people, but they're able to tolerate you. Aren't you special? If given the choice, I definitely would choose another topic to discuss. However, I was led to speak on this one. And I must admit that I've heard others speak on this topic from both ends of the spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, they seem unapologetically harsh and uncaring. On the other end of the spectrum, they seem too liberal and non-scriptural. Neither sat well with me. So with that being said, this is how I approach a topic that is by nature very sensitive. I'm going to stick with the Tanakh or Old Testament scriptures regarding this matter. And for some of you, that's a spoiler alert. You know how this is going to end. Or maybe not. So, what is a person to do? You wake up one day to the fact of who you are. That the history of your people's enslavement was a prophetic event. That you are a descendant of the tribe of Yehuda scattered to the four corners of the earth. That the injustice of your people and the affliction they're still suffering lines up with biblical prophecy. And you just happen to be married to a descendant of those who enslaved your people. Or married to a person who are currently exploiting, oppressing, and persecuting your people. We must also take into account that children may have been birthed from this marriage. So that's quite a dilemma, wouldn't you say? Now my question to you is, how do you respond if a person in that situation came to you for biblical answers regarding marrying other nationalities? Feel free to put it in the comment section. I do ask that you please keep your comments in a respectful manner. This is a very sensitive subject, and as you will see in Scripture, the dilemma is very real. Now, if you're not sure what you will say if someone requested a response from you on this topic, hopefully by the end of this discussion, you'll be able to articulate a sound biblical response. It may not be what they want to hear, but it's scriptural nonetheless. My goal in this discussion is to bring awareness to the dilemma that our ancestors face coming out of Babylonian captivity and the option presented to them regarding their strange wives. Also to shed light for those who may not understand on the reasoning behind not being able to marry outside of Yazrael. And lastly, the exception to the rule. Yes, there are exceptions according to scripture. However, as we come out of our 400-year captivity, we'll see some similarities with our ancestors coming out of their 70-year Babylonian captivity with their strange wives. Now, many of our people like or maybe appreciate the idea that we're a holy nation that is set aside for the Most High's pleasure. However, many may find it difficult to understand what that actually means. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with being a set-aside holy nation. And granted, we don't look like much of a holy people right now as we dwell in the land of our captivity. 
immersed in idolatrous traditions, conditions of poverty, perversion, surrounded by many people that will exploit us for their gain, and stalked by those desiring to destroy us as a people. Although our history has been hidden, our identity stolen, our inheritance promised by the Most High remains intact. Let me repeat that. Our inheritance promised by the Most High remains intact. Our people have been through a lot of trauma for the past 400 plus years. The fact that we have not been totally destroyed as a people and still have the will to resist our oppressors should it be a convincing factor that our inheritance, the Most High promise our ancestors, still awaits us. It is not by our strength alone that we survive, but the will of the Most High. All praise and glory to the Most High Yah, the Elohim of Yahsrael. So, as I was saying, being the Most High's people, a holy people, comes great responsibility. And one of those great responsibilities is not to give our sons and daughters away in marriage to other nations, according to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 3 through 4. And I read, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Mingling with other nations caused our ancestors to chase after other gods. You must understand, after mingling comes making covenants in marriage, which in itself can be a religious ceremony invoking the names of other gods. Then, celebrating family holidays, which you are expected to attend and pay homage to their gods. The Most High knows His people and desires for us to be separate from other nations. When our ancestors mingled with other nations, they adopted their ways and their gods, which was and still is a big problem with the Most High. Perhaps as a people, we're too easily influenced and easily impressed by others. Just look at us as a people today. How we accept anyone into our culture. How we allow industries to change the face of our culture. How we fought to integrate with a people who totally rejected us. And how we readily forgive other nationalities who repeatedly betray us. There's no other people like us, so-called black people. And the Most High has good reasons for wanting to keep his people separate. There's a reason why he provided laws, statutes, and commandments for his people to live by. Without them, we'll basically stop following the Most High and start following other nations, their deities, and lose our inheritance. Sounds familiar? Well, it should. Many of you already know that this is not our people's first captivity. Many know about the deliverance from Egyptian bondage. However, that was before the covenant the Most High made with his people. With that being said, this 400-year captivity that's coming to a close resembles our ancestors' Babylonian captivity, more so than Egyptian bondage. So, let us refer back to our ancestors coming out of their 70-year Babylonian captivity. Keeping in mind that one main difference between our captivity today and our ancestors' captivity in Babylon is that our ancestors knew who they were. They knew where they came from. They knew the name of their people, and they knew that their Elohim was the Most High. In other words, although they were captive, they were not a lost people. Unlike today, we have no recollection of our history as a people. So, the dilemma our ancestors faced coming out of Babylonian captivity was that they took women of other nations as wives. That's right. Our ancestors had sexual access in Babylon, just as we have today in the land of our captivity. Now, let's see how that situation was addressed according to Ezra, chapter 10, verses 1 through 12, 
and I read. Now when Ezra had prayed, and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God, and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord, and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage, and do it. Then arose Ezra, and made the chief priests, the Levites, and all Israel, to swear that they should do according to this word, and they swear. Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God, and went into the chamber of Johanan, the son of Eliashib. And when he came thither, he did eat no bread nor drink water, for he mourned because of the transgression of them that had been carried away. And they made proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem unto all the children of the captivity, that they should gather themselves together unto Jerusalem. And that whosoever would not come within three days, according to the counsel of the princess and the elders, all his substance should be forfeited, and himself separated from the congregation of those that had been carried away. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. It was the ninth month, on the twelfth day of the month, and all the people sat in the street of the house of God, trembling because of this matter, and for the great rain. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed, and have taken strange wise to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers, and do his pleasure, and separate yourselves from the people of the land, from the strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. As you can see, this was no matter to be taken lightly. Living happily ever after with their strange wives from Babylon was not the plan when our ancestors returned to the land. Now here we are today, coming to the end of our last captivity as a people. And many of our people are in the same predicament as our ancestors coming out of Babylon. A very difficult choice to make. And let's be clear. It was a choice to put away their strange wives or forfeit all their substance and separate from the congregation according to verse 8. So, they didn't face the penalty of death by stoning if they chose to keep their strange wives. No, not at all. They had the choice to keep her or lose their inheritance promised by the Most High. Let's look at another scripture that addresses the same situation of our ancestors coming out of Babylonian captivity. But this time it's Nehemiah. According to Nehemiah chapter 13, verses 23 through 26. Now, before I read this scripture verbatim from the King James Version Bible, keep in mind that there is no letter J in the Hebrew alphabet. So when you hear the J word, don't let it distract you from what the scripture is actually telling us. And I read. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them and cursed them, and smote certain of them, 
and plucked off their hair, and make them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. As you can see, our ancestors who served the Most High were very serious about the issues of having strange wives and giving your sons and daughters away in marriage to other nations. Even the wise and beloved King Solomon, as described in verse 26, did not profit by having wives from other nations. It actually caused him to lose part of his kingdom, which is why the twelve tribes split into two weakened kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Yazrael and the southern kingdom of Yehuda. Little did our ancestors know at that time, the stage was being set for them to be given into the hand of their enemies. And all of King Solomon's wisdom could not spare him from being influenced by his heathen wives the wise King Solomon. So we must understand that the common man doesn't stand a chance of maintaining his integrity with the Most High while taking on strange wives. Let's take a closer look at a wise king's horrible mistake according to 1 Kings chapter 11 verses 1 through 11 and I read. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods, Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as David his father. Then Solomon built an high place for Shemash, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. There you have it, family. King Solomon the same wise king who built the temple for the Most High, paid a hefty price for honoring the gods of his strange wives. It is what it is, family. Getting with strange women can be done, but in many cases there's consequences. Perhaps you have a strange wife and you see her as an exception to the rule. And yeah, there are exceptions according to Scripture. Let's go to it. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 10 through 14, and I read. When thou goest forth to war against thine enemies, 
and the Lord thy God hath delivered them into thine hands, and thou hast taken them captive. And seest among the captives a beautiful woman, and hast a desire unto her, that thou wouldest have her to thy wife. Then thou shalt bring her home to thine house, and she shall shave her head, and pare her nails. And she shall put the raiment of her captivity from off her, and shall remain in thine house, and be well her father and her mother a full month, and after that thou shalt go on into her, and be her husband, and she shall be thy wife. And it shall be, if thou have no delight in her, then thou shalt let her go whether she will. But thou shalt not sell her at all for money. Thou shalt not make merchandise of her, because thou hast humbled her. So, as you can see, the process involved in taking on a strange wife, which doesn't apply in our situation because we're the ones who are held captive. But notice, in verse 12, where she had to shave her head and pare her nails. Let's be clear. That strange wife came into the congregation humbled and not paraded around as a trophy wife with her head held high. No, not at all. She comes with her head shaved and not elevated above the daughters of Zion in any way. There's no confusion. She understands her place. And because we're a righteous nation, this strange wife won't be turned into a slave or servant if the husband is not pleased with her. He'll let her go. And what about Ruth? As in the book of Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite woman, daughter-in-law to Naomi, who had two sons that dwelled in Moab and married Moabite women. Now, when Naomi's two sons died, she told both her Moabite daughter-in-laws to go their own way because Naomi was returning to the land promised. One of her daughter-in-laws went her own way, but let's look at what Ruth said to Naomi according to Ruth chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, and I read. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth claved unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Now, we can clearly see that Ruth was different. She chose Naomi over her own people, over her own family. Honestly, how many strange wives would say such a profound thing to their so-called black mother-in-law? How many are willing to leave their own people and their gods to follow their so-called black mother-in-law? And to say, your people shall be my people and thy God my God. How many strange wives within our community have the qualities of Ruth? Now let's be clear. Many strange wives today can barely tolerate being around their so-called black mother-in-laws. It's just her son that they're infatuated with. Without him, there's no relationship. The rest of the family be damned as far as the strange wives are concerned. Brothers and sisters, I'm certain you know what I'm speaking of. And how often do strange wives today limit the amount of time their children spend with their so-called black grandmother. So clearly, Ruth was cut from a different cloth as she claved into her mother-in-law Naomi, her people and her Elohim. And Ruth was known among Yazrael to be a virtuous woman, according to her soon-to-be husband Boaz. Let's go to Ruth, chapter 3, verse 11, 
and I read. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. A virtuous woman and a stranger. So Ruth marries Boaz, kin to Naomi's late husband. She married Boaz in the proper order according to Torah and became the great grandmother of our beloved King David, the great warrior king. All praise to the Most High Yah. He can choose whomever he please to do whatever he pleases. And we as a people must be prepared to welcome the stranger who will cleave to the Most High's people in righteousness and in truth. Just as Ruth told Naomi, your people shall be my people and your Elohim shall be my Elohim. How many strangers are out there today making such a profound declaration? And I'm not speaking for marriage, but to cleave to the Most High's people because of who we are. So in conclusion, we saw through scripture where having strange wives could be disastrous as in King Solomon's situation and our ancestors coming out of Babylon's situation. We also saw through scripture in cases where it's permitted. I believe that it's safe to presume that if our brother is not in right standing with the Most High, when he chooses a strange wife, she won't be in right standing with the Most High. She will be a detriment to that brother and not know her place among our people. When the stranger cleaves to the Most High's people, as did Ruth, it's a benefit to us all. With that being said, always keep your trust in the Most High. Love Him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. See to it that your household is in line with the Word of the Most High as best you can. I thank you for taking the time to watch. Again, I am Rael, your reunited soul brother. And with that, I say to you, Shalom.